message of Ezra is our study this morning. And the key verse is Ezra chapter 7, verse 10. For Ezra had devoted himself to the study and observance of the law of the Lord and to teaching its decrees and laws in Israel. More on this verse later. So let me start off then talking about its analysis. Ezra describes the return of the people of Judah from captivity in Babylon and the history that followed. It covers the period from 536 to 432 BC. And the date of writing is about uh, 425 BC. Now there are two parts to the book. First of all, we get the return under Zerubbabel in chapters 1 through 6. This took place in 536 BC. Zerubbabel's goal was to rebuild the temple. Now here under this first half, uh, here are some parts. Number one, the people are released in chapter one. Cyrus, king of Persia, conquered the Babylonians who had taken the people of Judah into captivity in the first place. And now Cyrus, the king of Persia, permits the Jews to return to their homeland. And Zerubbabel is their leader, the leader of the people going back. So that's chapter one. In chapter two, the people are registered. Here we have a list of the exiles who returned to Judah and Jerusalem, its capital. Third, the people are rebuilding in chapter three. Here's where they begin to rebuild the temple that had been destroyed by King Nebuchadnezzar of the Babylonians in 586 BC. And then the people are resisted in chapter four. Opposition to the rebuilding of the temple by pretended friends who were really enemies takes place here in chapter four. And then in chapter five, the people are renewed. The rebuilding of the temple gets started again. And then in chapter six, the people are rejoicing because the rebuilding of the temple is completed. So that's all the first part of Ezra, the return under Zerubbabel in chapters one through six. Now in chapters 7 through 10, we see the return under Ezra. And this took place in 456 BC. Now, Ezra's goal was to rebuild the people. Remember, in the first return, Zerubbabel, the spiritual leader in Judah, his goal was to rebuild the temple. And now a second wave of Jews are coming back to their homeland. Ezra is their leader. And the temple's already been rebuilt, so his goal is to rebuild the people. Four parts. The people are released in chapter 7. Now, back in chapter 1, it was Cyrus, king of Persia, who let the Jews come back. Now it's Artaxerxes, a later king of Persia, who lets a second wave of Jews return home. And then in chapter 8, the people are registered. Here is a list of the exiles who returned with Ezra. Then from chapter 9, verse 1, through chapter 10, verse 4, the people are repentant. Ezra prays for the men who had sinned in their marriages by marrying pagan wives the Lord had forbidden them to marry. And then fourth, the people are reformed in chapter 10, verses 5 through 44. This is where the men confess their own sins and put away their pagan wives. So there's the analysis of the book of Ezra. Now let me talk about its author. Ezra's example in this book teaches us the following lessons. One is be disciplined in God's word. Now we're coming back to the key verse in the book, Ezra 7, 10. For Ezra had devoted himself to the study and observance of the law of the Lord 
and to teaching its decrees and laws in Israel. Ezra studied, he obeyed, and he taught God's word. And it says here, he devoted himself to these three things. Now notice what the first one was. He devoted himself to the study, and second, and observance of the law. Observance here means obedience to the law. He, he was observing the commands, obeying. So first he studied, and then he obeyed, and then it says, and to teaching its decrees and laws in Israel. This is what qualified him as a teacher. He studied God's word, and he obeyed God's word. Now, let me share with you uh, five steps that I like to follow in Bible study. Step number one, read it through. If you read for just about 15 minutes a day, every day of the year, you'll read the entire Bible in about 11 months. It's not that hard to read the Bible cover to cover in one year. Step number two, pray it in. Pray that God will make this a reality, what you're reading in your daily Bible study. Uh, third step, write it down. I always read the Bible with a, a yellow marker. I love highlighting words that I'm reading that just jump out at me. Precious promises or even warnings or teachings. And, and, so, and, and I encourage you to Mark up your Bible, write it down. And then step number four, work it out. Let it become a part of your life. Put it into practice in your life. And then step number five, pass it on. Teach it to other people. And this is what Ezra was doing in his life. These five things, basically. This is how he made practical his study of the Bible. Somebody once said, if you've got a Bible that is falling apart, it indicates that you are well put together. And I, I like that. You use your Bible and, and use it up. Okay, so that's one thing from Ezra's example. Here's a second lesson from his example. Look for how God is working in your daily life. Now, a good example of this is from chapter 7, verses 27 and 8. He says, Praise be to the Lord, the God of our fathers, who has put it into the king's heart to bring honor to the house of the Lord in Jerusalem in this way and who has extended his good favor to me before the king, this is King Artaxerxes of the Persians, he was a pagan, and his advisors and all the king's powerful officials. Because, of the hand, because the hand of the Lord my God was on me, I took courage and gathered leading men from Israel to go up with me. Here Ezra gave God the credit for working through a pagan king, Artaxerxes of the Persians, for good in his life, in Ezra's life. In the early 1970s, I was in the bus station in Spokane, Washington one day. I was on my way back from summer vacation, or maybe it was Christmas vacation, back to the University of Idaho where I was a student. So I was gonna get on this bus in Spokane and travel down to Moscow, Idaho to the campus. So I'm waiting for my bus, you know, and so forth, and I notice these two Jesus people. Now, if you don't remember who the Jesus people were, they were people in the early 1970s who were also hippies, but they, they believed in Jesus and very passionate about the Lord. Well, anyway, so these two Jesus people walk up to the counter there, and they say, uh, we're going to be on the bus going to such and such a city. When does that leave? And I heard the guy behind the counter say, oh, I'm sorry, that, that bus left an hour ago. And one of these Jesus people turned to his friend, turned to the other, and said, I wonder why the Lord had us miss our bus. 
and I felt like screaming at them, it was your own carelessness that caused you to miss the bus, not the Lord. But then I thought to myself, oh, wait a minute. You know what? Ultimately, they're right. Because God is in control. He is such a kind and generous God that he even works through our careless mistakes. He's done that with me many, many times. Look for how God is working in your daily life. Number three, trust God for your safety. I see this in chapter 8, verses 21 to 23. There, by the Ahava Canal, I proclaimed a fast so that we might humble ourselves before our God and ask Him for a safe journey for us and our children with all our possessions. I was ashamed to ask the king for soldiers and horsemen to protect us from the enemies on the road because we had told the king, the gracious hand of our God is on everyone who looks to him, but his great anger is against all who forsake him. So we fasted and petitioned our God about this, and he answered our prayers. This is the journey back to Judah from where they were in exile. Now, sometimes in our family, uh, all four of us, Mary and I and Tommy and Leslie, are, are going to be getting in our cars and we're going to different places, four different places in the same day. Now, you can understand that. And many times in our early morning family prayer time, I, I have prayed, Lord, you know, all four of us are going to be traveling to some different destination today and we trust you to keep your hand on each one of our cars Thank you that even though we are going in different directions, you're going with each one of us at the same time. Trust God for your safety. Number four, never get used to the sin around you. Here we are now in Ezra 9, 1 through 4. After these things had been done, the leaders came up to me and said, the people of Israel, including the priests and the Levites, have not kept themselves separate from the neighboring peoples with their detestable practices, like those of the Can Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Jebusites, Ammonites, Moabites, Egyptians, and Ammonites. By the way, stop right there. Just last one Wednesday night, uh, Lyle Young told me uh, that we've got one of these groups in our church, not the Canaanites who are listed here, but the, the Cainites. And the Cainites are the people who walk around with canes in their, in their hands like Lyle himself does. So we want to put them in here too, okay? Well, anyway, okay, back to verse 2 now. They have taken some of their daughters as wife for them, wives for themselves and their sons and have mingled the holy race and the peoples around them. And the leaders and officials have led the way in this unfaithfulness. When I heard this, I tore my tunic and cloak, pulled hair from my head and beard, and sat down appalled. Then everyone who trembled at the words of the God of Israel gathered around me because of this unfaithfulness of the exiles. And I sat there appalled until the evening sacrifice. It says here that he was appalled at the sin around him in verses 3 and 4. Now, you know, I, uh, being a pastor and serving in the church and so forth, you know, I, I have a, just a wonderful environment almost always during the week. You know, I'm dealing with people like you and people who know and love the Lord. And it's just terrific. But, but I realize that our kids... Leslie and Tommy, Andrea's often married now with family of her own. But anyway, Tommy and Leslie, you know, they, they don't work in the church and, and they're young and they, they hear a lot of foul language all week long. And, and I, I know that. But nonetheless, I have still told them, please don't ever get used 
to that foul language. I know you hear the worst, filthiest words that can come out of a person's mouth on a regular basis. But please, don't ever get used to it. Always, always stay fresh in the Lord. Another person in the Bible who didn't get used to it was Lot, who lived in Sodom back in the book of Genesis. And here's what the New Testament says about him in 2 Peter 2, 7 and 8. And if he, that's God, rescued Lot, a righteous man who was distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless, so he was distressed, for that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. Lot didn't get used to the Sodomites. Even though he lived there for a long time, he was daily tormented. So never get used to the sin around you. Ezra didn't. Number five, be honest with God when you confess your sins. Listen to Ezra's confession in chapter 9, verses 5 through 15. Then at the evening sacrifice, I rose from my self-abasement with my tunic and cloak torn and fell on my knees with my hands spread out to the Lord my God and prayed, O oh my God, I am too ashamed and disgraced to lift up my face to you, my God, because our sins are higher than our heads and our guilt has reached to the heavens. From the days of our forefathers until now, our guilt has been great. Because of our sins, we and our kings and our priests have been subjected to the sword in captivity, to pillage and humiliation at the hand of foreign kings, as it is today. But now, for a brief moment, the Lord our God has been gracious in leaving us a remnant and giving us a firm place in his sanctuary. And so our God gives light to our eyes and a little relief in our bondage. Though we are slaves, our God has not deserted us in our bondage. He has shown us kindness in the sight of the kings of Persia. He has granted us new life to rebuild the house of our God and repair its ruins. And he has given us a wall of protection in Judah and Jerusalem. But now, O oh our God, what can we say after this? For we have disregarded the commands you gave through your servants, the prophets, when you said, the land you are entering to possess is a land polluted by the corruption of its peoples. By their detestable practices, they have filled it with their impurity from one end to the other. Therefore, do not give your daughters in marriage to their sons or take their daughters for your sons. Do not seek a treaty of friendship with them at any time that you may be strong and eat the good things of the land and leave it to your children as an everlasting inheritance. What has happened to us is a result of our evil deeds and our great guilt. And yet, our God, you have punished us less than our sins have deserved and have given us a remnant like this. Shall we again break your commands and intermarry with the peoples who commit such detestable practices? Would you not be angry enough with us to destroy us, leaving us no remnant or survivor? O oh Lord, God of Israel, you are righteous. We are left this day as a remnant. Here we are before you in our guilt, though because of it not one of us can stand in your presence. Now here Ezra opens his guilty heart to God in confession of sin. He offers no excuses, no complaints, no deals with God. He mentions guilt four times, iniquities three times, abominations two times, bondage two times, evil deeds two times, plus forsaking God's commandments and breaking his commandments. Now, we all know that our human nature doesn't like to confess our sins. Our human nature makes excuses for them, tries to justify them, and so forth. 
Here is Dale Carnegie's book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. It was one of the most best-selling, one of the, the best-selling books of the mid-20th century. Now he talks in this book about if you really want to win friends and influence people, don't ever criticize anybody for anything. And here's why. Listen to this. 99 times out of 100, no man ever criticizes himself for anything, no matter how wrong he may be. So just goes to illustrate, it is human nature not to confess our sins. It goes against the grain of our human nature, but that just shows how by God's grace, we can be different, and God wants us to be different. Here's a letter I photocopied that I received from a woman who used to be a member of our church. Years ago, she was in our church and uh, really an excellent volunteer. But somehow, she just kind of, I don't know, I, uh, criticized me a lot. And, and I knew this, and I was aware of it, and I felt it, and yeah, you know, kind of hurt and so forth. And she eventually left the church and went to another church. And when she did, I, I wasn't the least bit surprised because, you know, she was like always kind of on my case. Well, let me read you this letter that came a couple of years after she left. Dear Tom, Lately, I've been convicted of how I've treated you in the past. I thought I had dealt with this, but it always keeps coming up, so I must not have, at least not properly. I am asking forgiveness for not being supportive of you and your ministry like I should have. I should have spent my energy praying for you and our church instead of complaining. It was wrong to tear down and not build up, I'm sure my words and actions hurt you and others. Please forgive me. I know I can expect that. Thank you for your commitment and dedication to serving God. Well, she not only sent me this letter, but she also came to see me. And the whole thing just very, very deeply touched my heart and was just a, a wonderful reconciliation between her and, and me. Be honest with God when you confess your sins. And then number six from Ezra's example is prove your repentance by changing your ways. Ezra's prayer in chapter nine led to his people's repentance and putting away their pagan wives in chapter 10. All right, now we're going to finish up talking about its application. And I've got four pieces of application from the book of Ezra. Number one, we also need to return to our homeland, and our homeland is God. You know, we, we see two returns of the exiles in Ezra from in chapter one and chapter seven in the book of Ezra. We too need to go back, and when we do turn to God, it's because he has stirred up the hearts of other people. Watch how that was true in Ezra's case in chapter 1, verse 5. Then the family heads of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and Levites, everyone whose heart God had moved, prepared to go up and build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. So God moved the, in our, our, the hearts of us and fellow people, and also the hearts of other people who maybe aren't like us at all. Chapter 1, verse 1. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord, spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and to put it in writing. And in many cases, in our case, when people move in other people's hearts, He's moving them to, to pray for us. And, and that's why we need to return to our homeland. I think of Deron, who's here today and baptized him a couple of weeks ago and 
Part of his testimony was how he had gotten far away from the Lord, but wherever he went, Santa Barbara and Florida and Bakersfield and Reedley, there was always somebody there to witness to him and like say, oh, you're away from the Lord. You need to come back. And Deron said, well, why are you people always on my case like this? And this guy in Reedley said, because you've got people who are praying for you. God stirs up the hearts of other people. All right, here's a second application. God is faithful to keep his promises. Now, God vowed that the exile would last only seven years. God had promised that. In Jeremiah 25, verse 11, listen to this. Jeremiah said, This whole country will become a desolate wasteland, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Wow. God predicted through Jeremiah right down to the year how long the exile would be. And Ezra shows how God moved in Cyrus's heart in the first verse of the book in order to keep his promise. Now Josephus, who is a Jewish historian, even says that uh, Cyrus read his own name in the Bible. And Cyrus's name is in the Bible in Isaiah 44, 28. Speaking of God, it says, who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and I will accomplish all that I please. He will say of Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt and of the temple, let its foundations be laid. Here's God predicting that Cyrus will, will give the order to rebuild the uh, temple. And then chapter 45, verse 1 in Isaiah is similar. This is what the Lord says to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of, to subdue nations before him and to strip kings of their armor, to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. Now here's the fascinating thing. Isaiah wrote about Cyrus 200 years before Cyrus ever came to the throne almost 200 years before Cyrus was even born. And Cyrus reads his name in the Bible. And he says, God wants me to let the people go <laughs> and go back and, and rebuild their, tell them to rebuild their temple. Wow. And so looking at it that way, the Lord moved in Cyrus's heart. Chapter one, verse one says it that way. And he did it by means of his word. Cyrus's heart got moved by the Lord because of what he read in the Bible. Here's one of many illustrations in my own life how God did that. When I became a student at the University of Idaho, I knew it wasn't a Christian college, that's obvious. But I thought to myself, well, this is a university campus, and even though a lot of people here are not going to be Christians, they're going to understand what the gospel is. They're going to understand what I believe, even if they don't believe it. They're going to be aware that what I and other Christians believe is that Jesus was the Son of God who came down from heaven and died on a cross to pay the price for the sins of the world, and that if, if we trust in him and his death on the cross, God will forgive our sins, make us his children, and give us a home in heaven. Salvation comes not by us being good people, but by trusting in Christ. I figured, well, it, they'll know that even if they don't accept it. And boy, was I ever wrong. Not only other students I was talking to had no idea what the gospel was, but even some professors, I couldn't believe it, obviously didn't know what Christians believed. And then there in my dormitory at Idaho, one day I was reading my daily devotions and I was in the book of Ezekiel and I read in Ezekiel chapter 3 and again in 33, God said to Ezekiel, I have made you a watchman to the people. I'm going to warn them, and if you tell them the warning and they don't repent, I will judge them, but I'll hold you 
faultless because you warned them. But Ezekiel, if you don't warn them, then I'm going to judge them and I'm going to judge you too. Their blood is going to be on your hands because I'm making you a watchman to the people of Israel. And when I read that about Ezekiel, I knew God was saying the same thing to me. Tom, I'm making you a watchman to the people. You've got, uh, you're going to spend your life warning people about unbelief and rejecting Jesus Christ and urging them to, to come to Christ. I already had known for years and years that I was going to be a pastor when I grew up, that God's call was on my life. But nonetheless, God just confirmed it so much through that experience of being on the campus there at Idaho and then reading that, that uh, passage. All right, here's a third application. When we return to God after being away from him, we can expect opposition from all sides. That's what the people got in chapter 4 when they started rebuilding the temple. Opposition came up and even stopped the rebuilding. Fortunately, it resumed later. But Satan despises a committed Christian. So don't be surprised by opposition. I've seen this kind of opposition. A woman becomes a Christian, she's already married, and her husband says, well, if, if you're gonna be a Christian, if you're gonna follow Christ, then I am not gonna stay in this marriage. You've got to choose right now between Jesus and me because I am not gonna tolerate this opposition. Or a person who takes a stand for the Lord in their family and they get accused of dividing the family. Why, why, why are you dividing our family? But Jesus warned that would be the case. Okay, and then here's a fourth application and the final one. God is always in control of our lives. Now, we've already read Ezra chapter 1, verse 1, but let me just read it again. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and to put it in writing. And the proclamation was, you Jews are free to go home now. So that referred to Cyrus's heart. And over in chapter 7, verse 27, we get the same thing referring to King Artaxerxes. Ezra says, Praise be to the Lord, the God of our fathers, who has put it into the king's heart. This time it's Artaxerxes. To bring honor to the house of the Lord in Jerusalem in this way. So if God can sway the hearts of kings who don't know him, he can guide the paths of us who are committed to him. I'm going to close with a little story here about Kathleen Kelly's daughter, Georgia Soares. Maybe you know her. She's been in our church many times visiting her mom and so forth. Georgia had a brain tumor a while back. They did brain surgery on her. They took it out. Fortunately, it was not cancerous. But unfortunately, following the surgery, you know, her face was, it, it just didn't look the same. It didn't look uh, normal. She, she had a a little bit of, you know, disfigurement going on there in her face. Now, Georgia, just like her mother, is a poet. And so she wrote this little poem about all of that, and it's titled, Let It Go and Let It Be. People keep saying, you are strong. I feel like I am frail and weak. People tell me, life goes on. I feel I'm on a losing streak. People say, hey, you look great. I look in the mirror and wait and wait. Please come back, I tell my face. To God, I kneel and plead my case. People say, I can hardly tell. All I want to do is scream and yell. I've been cheated. I've been robbed. And then I wind up on the floor and sob. That's when the voice, so sweet and still, says, Remember, 
I love you. And this is my will. In this life, you will feel pain. The storms will come along with rain. I will refine you pure as gold, as I do each sheep in my fold. My plans for you are good, not bad. So don't lose heart and don't be sad. Even if healing isn't 100%, you can count on this, Georgia, it is heaven sent. For all your days have been ordained and also that thing they found in your brain. All of this is no surprise to me. So let it go and let it be. God is in control. What a wonderful God.